You're listening to Don't Waste Water. So a company like us in tech, for example, in the Silicon Valley, which has raised about $400 million total to date, as a unicorn, has done series D level of funding, normally would have one to one and a half percent owned by employees. We have 7%. And that doesn't include Anurav and me, of course. Uh, as founders, we own a huge chunk also. How huge is that chunk, which you still own with Anurag? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are fine. Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Waste Water podcast. We picked a business model that the client liked. If you take our ENP customers at that time, they don't own the rigs. They don't own any of the equipment. They just have the mineral rights and they explore and produce. So why would they own the water assets? That's the reason we went BOO, not because of a big uh, Eureka moment where we figured out that for the entire water industry, the BOO model works. I don't want to be another Metito. I don't want to be another Veolia even. Gradient, for the lack of a better analogy, is the Google of the water industry. I'm your host, Antoine Valter, and in today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Prakash Govindan as my guest. Where the water industry frustrates me, honestly, is that lack of vision. The people who are sending people to Mars or making electric vehicles are able to inspire and sell a dream to the general public. Whereas something as important and fundamental to life as water, why is our industry not able to inspire others? Prakash is the co-founder and COO of Gradient. About 60% of Gradient's projects even today are sole sourced for that reason. 60% of Gradient's projects has no competition because we develop the solution from scratch for our client. Gradient sees itself as a different kind of water company committed to ensuring clean, fresh water for generations to come. Anurag and I have never dwelled upon and sat and strategized how we will exit. You might think this is not music to the ears of my investors, but it is. The investors we have brought on board without exception, each and every one of them want us to build the most impactful water company in the world and the exit side of it for for them will naturally come. Nirav often jokes I'll get fired shortly after we IPO. <laughs> You're too well connected. Maybe I shouldn't say so many things to you. <laughs> <laughs> It's the time of the year when one has to pick who's the water company of the year as the Global Water Awards are around the corner. I'm not a huge fan of awards in general, but as this one is open to votes, why not campaign, right? <laughs> Let's be clear, I have no affiliation with Gradient and they have not paid me a cent, neither for this episode nor for any fancy upcoming sponsorship deal. And I have nothing against any of the other nominees for the most prestigious of all the awards given out every year by GWI. But no offense to Ideo Technologies, Metito and Suez, I would believe that Gradient deserves the title this year. Of course, you don't have to believe me just like that. You should listen to Prakash and make up your mind. Here's a little summary, though, of some of what Gradient achieved in 2023. First, they became the first ever unicorn in the water sector, so the first private company to reach a billion dollar valuation thanks to a $225 million Series D, and this after just one decade of existence. That's both crazy and crazy fast. 2023 also saw them double their revenue, acquire HE, &E, branch out their AI business with their Turing daughter company, venture into new playgrounds with PFAS removal and direct lithium extraction, and solidify their new Abu Dhabi hub from which Prakash is joining today. Enough to take the crown that's still on Aqualia's head for a couple more weeks? You heard my opinion. Now it's time to build yours. But before we start in this 11th season of the podcast, let me warn you that you may see some slight changes as I'm doubling down on water entrepreneur stories and on actionable and inspiring insights. If that's to your taste, you can help me out tremendously by taking this episode and sharing it with a colleague, a friend, your boss or your team. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll meet you on the other side. Hi Prakash, welcome to the show. Hi Antoine, very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I can't tell you how excited I am right now to have you because how often do you have the chance to interview a unicorn? If you're in water like me, there's only one and it's speaking with you. So <laughs> I'm super pumped up, but I like to identify your special source. When I looked up your path, one may think that your special source is in your 250 patents, your 10 proprietary technologies, your rapid growth to 90G turnover, your status as the first and only water unicorn, your seven company acquisitions in just four years, or your $225 million Series D, which are topics I all 
want to cover today, but I think that's still not your special sauce. I would believe that your special sauce is your business model. Am I wrong? It is definitely in the mix. That is unique, but I have a strong opinion on this. That, you know, if you ask different people in Gradient, depending on their role, they might give you slightly different answers, whatever secret sauces. For me, it's the people. I have technically and surely in terms of company culture and at attitude, the best group of people I could have possibly assembled. For me, that's Gradient secret sauce. Not everybody gets to see it because a lot of these people are internal, not necessarily client facing or external facing, which is just a pity. I hope to expose a lot more people to, to the outside world over the next few years. So if you mention people, how many people are working for Gradient today? I got a count about a month ago, about 1100 plus, which is scary. It was just two guys in a basement lab, 77 Mass Ave at MIT, and uh, 1100 people, can you believe it? 1100 in 11 years, so that makes a crazy pace. We'll go into the M&A part, but how, how many of those people come from your M&A moves and how many are the organic growth of Gradients? Do you have figures or do you read, never separate those two? In terms of organic and inorganic, let me talk in terms of turnover or revenue. It's easier that way. Towards the end of 2023, Gradient did its largest acquisition, H plus E, Aquarian, which you covered in a nice video and podcast. I think the title of the video was, Will Gradient Succeed? Where Suez and all these others have failed. I love the title, by the way. Thank you. We will succeed. But that was towards the end of the year. So not counting for H plus E, we did about 200 million in revenue last year. And about 87% uh, of that is organic revenue. So only 13% is inorganic revenue. Which will bring me to the question of why you did the M&A nevertheless. But I'll keep that for later in the conversation. Because for now, I'd like really to understand what the word look like when you started and what made you think you can change that? So what was the first thing you identified and which you said, that's what we solve? One thing you have to understand about Gradient is uh, it was started by two guys with little to no experience in water. I had at least worked for GE on the combined cycle power plant side, but mainly new products. That's my core forte is I develop really good products. So uh, that's my passion, solutions and products. Anurag very proudly says he's never worked anywhere outside of Crane. When we first came in, we saw a big opportunity in oil and gas in the U.S. because hydraulic fracturing was taking off in the U.S. The hydraulic fracturing method requires a lot of water and a lot of it was unknown and was right for a new company with new technology and fresh eyes to come in and disrupt. At one point in our peak, we were owning and operating 25 uh, water treatment plants for Chevron, Exxon, ConocoPhillip. But what we realized in that journey is we are really good at developing technology and solutions, especially bespoke solutions to solve exact problems. Second, our expertise is applicable way more than just oil field in the US. Third, Oil field is tied to factors which make it difficult to uh, build sustainable companies in water just focusing on the oil field just on the US. So we diversified and after six years of just focusing of oil field in the US, Anurag and I started traveling to India, China, Singapore and we won projects there in flue gas desulfurization wastewater. We won projects in pharmaceutical industry with GlaxoSmithKline. We won projects in textile in India. And where, you know, others have went in, we could do better. This was eye-opening for our clients. They didn't think the cost of water could be brought down for, for example, for zero liquid discharge systems in textile in India, which, which is a very difficult market because it's a very price driven market, but we made a difference. So then we thought sky is the limit. Sorry to cut you, but just, th there's a lot to unpack here and I'd like really to take the time to unpack it. So before we go into this unpacking, I'd like to take just one step before, which is I'm nearly 200 episodes in. I've always said it takes time and all my guests have always said it takes time in that business. And still, you are at MIT with Anurag in 2008, you start your PhD. 2012, you end your PhD. 2013, you found Gradient. 2023, you're a unicorn. Between the time you start your PhD and the time you're a unicorn, there's not even 15 years, which is crazy fast in this industry. I'd like to understand the root of that. I've heard you speak about how you met Anurag at MIT. What I'd like to understand is at what point do you think, oh, 
that humidification, dehumidification technology we're working on is so cool that we have to spin it out and we have to become entrepreneurs. We both have a natural inkling to be entrepreneurs. In fact, if ever we have to work for someone, it will be very difficult to supervise us. We are self-driven, motivated, highly opinionated and risk takers. It's one of those things, you know, sometimes you have a kid and you know he's going to be a musician. Ever since childhood, I have started businesses out of my house in Chennai. I used to read a lot. The people who know me know this. I'm kind of a geek. So I read a lot. I had all these books in my house in Chennai and I started a library from, from my house making some pocket money when I was a child. Uh, this was eight, nine years old. Always had an inkling for this Anurag exactly the same. During our PhDs, we really hit it off. We wanted to work together. He developed a really cool technology, which was selected by Scientific American at the time as one of the game-changing ideas of that decade or something like that. Directional solvent extraction for concentrating brines. And I was working on this humidification, dehumidification technique, which on paper is much less sexy than directional solvent extraction. But we are practical people. I was able to, even during my PhD, scale up the technique. I had some funding from the oil field to treat the produce water. I gave them reports. They were very impressed. And they said, why don't you pilot this? Anurag and I had by that time decided we'll do something together. So I went to Anurag and said, these guys want us to pilot this. Should we raise some money? You know, we have never raised money before. Uh, Anurag uh, went and talked to everybody he could in the Boston ecosystem, MIT ecosystem. And a couple of MIT alumnus, Arunas Chesanas, who was on the MIT board, gave us a check and said, here you go, here is a million dollars, do what you can. Just out of belief that these guys will do something good and we'll treat him well. And boy, was he right. He continues to be one of our largest uh, investors even today. So we went from strength to strength. We do have a vision. And the vision is broad and bold. And where the water industry frustrates me, honestly, is that lack of vision. The people who are sending people to Mars or making electric vehicles are able to inspire and sell a dream to the general public. Whereas something as important and fundamental to life as water, why is our industry not able to inspire others? We treat waters to parts per quadrillion level purity. As microchips are getting faster and faster and the feature sizes are becoming smaller and smaller, we have to treat these waters to not parts per billion, not parts per trillion, parts per quadrillion level purity. Now that is cool science. We at the same time also have to deal with waters which are so contaminated, such a complex matrix, which can only be created by artificial industrial processes that range of the science that's involved in the in the range of purification that happens, it's much more than dumbed down. When people think of the water industry, somehow we have projected this image that we have some membrane or some filter which filters everything out. You and I know that's the farthest thing from the truth. We have, as an industry, failed to inspire and elevate water, which is our mission at Gradient now. I'm an honest guy. I'm not going to sit here and lie that. This is where we started. We had this big vision. No, we wanted a job. Okay. We had uh, a person who offered us a pilot. But as we understood the industry and as we built a stellar team around us, the vision has grown to elevate water and ensure water for generations to come. And fundamentally, everyone in the water industry, whether sometimes we compete with them or not, should support us because this elevates the valuation of the entire industry and not just you mentioned your first vertical. You mentioned this oil and gas, which somehow, and that's a part of the story I didn't have, which is that already in your time during your PhD, you got signs that it was getting traction and that you had something and you had to go out and to spin it out. At the time, I was working for Suez. Produced water and shale gas fracking water was one of the topics where we looked into it and then the decision was taken to say, oh, you know, it's not that much water and uh, it's a short time, so you can't really do CapEx sales uh, because they won't want to buy your stuff. We gave up on that. Would you say that we were wrong on that understanding or that simply we didn't get that there was a huge opportunity in what you just said, that you owned and operated those plants? And that was the trick. Somewhere in between, I wouldn't say you were completely wrong because uh, as a large company, Suez, looking at all that you were doing and your expertise, it's very different. Uh, decision making compared to a startup. You know, people talk about the value of debt and technology development and getting it 
to see the light of the day. Focus is one of the key words in ensuring that a solution gets to market and gains traction and is implemented practically. I'm not one to boast, but you know how many PhDs actually become products where it sees the light of the day. Sometimes the reason is there is lack of focus and we wanted a market where we can focus. And this was it, this oil and gas market right in our backyard, full of XX who were out of MIT so we could connect with them easily. And a whole bunch of other factors uh, just drove us to go after that market, but we didn't let it go. It's not a perfect market. There are ups and downs. We picked a business model that the client like. If you take our ENP customers at that time, they don't own the rigs. They don't own any of the equipment. They just have the mineral rights and they explore and produce. So why would they own the water assets? That's the reason we went BOO, not because of a big uh, Eureka moment where we figured out that for the entire water industry, the BOO model works. And since then, we have selectively used the BOO model in other industries. But you mentioned industries, and that's the second part, which is, I don't want to give the impression I was an executive at Suez, not at all. I was the entry junior guy just starting the company at that time. And actually, when I spoke with the senior guys, they told me, avoid the industrial space like the plaque. That's the thing you should not venture into because those guys don't pay, they don't have that much money, and they're short-term. Really, go to the municipal. You do exactly the opposite. And even when oil and gas starts to cool down in the US, when you branch out, as you mentioned, and you go to India and you go to China, you still focus industry. You don't go into municipal. So what did you see there that the traditional players didn't see? Less competition. Uh, in combination with our business model, especially at that time and, and even today, less competition and uh, faster traction, coupled with our ability to innovate and deliver bespoke solutions to each market, it was ideal for Gradient. I would have never survived if I wanted to compete with the Suez's of the world at that time. Today I do successfully at that time on municipal treatment plants. First of all, municipal treatment is in many ways simpler, whereas, for example, zero liquid discharge. I have this t-shirt, you know, Anurag gave me back in the day. It says gradient on top, and then it says variability in the middle, and in the back it says, is the hallmark of industrial water or produced water. It might have said produced water. I still have the t-shirt somewhere. We could deal with that, you know, with municipal uh, sewage and stuff, there is hardly variability. But if you take a pharmaceutical plant, right, let's say they are producing some kind of penicillin drug, they run the operations in batches. And they use different solvents in different batches to optimize their operational costs for their production reasons. What that means to a person dealing with the wastewater is you get widely different water in each batch. And each batch is only 8 to 12 hours long. So you have to build a water treatment plant which can deal with both and adapt itself. One of the fundamental tenets of gradient products, which makes us unique, is the smart, adaptable nature of our products. Artificial intelligence being a part of it is, has been from day one incorporated into our product. That's why I got my PhD. I came up with a non-dimensional number, which helped me deal with variability when it came to operators, humidification devices. I'm jumping in the timeline. I'll come back to here, but just because you mentioned artificial intelligence, you just branched that out of the main gradients, creating Turing. Can you explain me what that is? So what happened, it's a, I started developing these methods in carrier gas extraction for continuously being able to deal with variability in water quality and quantity. We developed methods, my team developed methods, which made it far superior than mechanical vapor compression and multi-effective operation in those variable situations. Then I thought, why not apply it to membranes? And I started to do that. And at some point I met Mike Dixon, who I knew at MIT, but I, d I didn't know what he was exactly working on with Sinota. And he had developed some of those things already. So that's where our acquisition journey started. We went and uh, figured out a way to join hands with Sinota. And then Sinota came on board. And there's another company in uh, Singapore called Space Age Labs who were doing really cool stuff with water networks and sewer overflows and preventing them. So we brought them on board also. And at that point, I had 60, 70 people working on the software side, the AI side of the business. And increasingly, I was hiring software engineers and AI engineers and machine learning engineers. And their pay scales 
are nothing like my chemical engineers. And it became difficult for me to uh, have all of that in the same company. And also it re required specialized leadership to focus on the software aspect of the business. And there were existing gradient investors who were interested in funding that separately. So we spun that out. Let me go back to, to the timeline. You mentioned you're branching out to now new industries because you're entering textile, uh, pharmaceuticals uh, in, in Asia, mostly. At that time, do you still have that single core technology, this gas carrier humidification, humidification technology, or do you also expand the technology at the same time? So you, you expand in all the dimensions at the same time. We did. Uh, carrier gas extraction was our flagship product for about a year of gradient. That's it. When we built the first uh, produced water zero liquid discharge plant in Pioneer Basin in, in, in Midland, Texas, we used the carrier gas technology as the core of it. Even today, we deploy many carrier gas extraction systems. But even then, we diversified into physiochemical systems. We invented CFRO, the first RO technology that can go to up to saturation of salt. CFRO, just for the muggle, counterflow reverse osmosis, right? Yes. Yes. Some, some call it the osmotically assisted reverse osmosis. I find that name to be confusing. So I use counterflow because uh, regular RO membranes are cross flow and I'm a heat exchange person. So I quanted culture flow most osmosis. And we developed uh, ROI, which is semi-batch driven RO techniques. GWI put it the best when they said in one of our award nominations from previous years that nobody in the last 10 years has brought more innovations and technology into the water industry than Gradient. I think factually true perhaps. How many years of these 10 years have you not been nominated for an award? <laughs> It's not my fault. <laughs> so 2012, when I was still at MIT, Tom Pankritz called me and said, there is this thing called Tech Idol. I said, sir, I can't afford tickets to Sevilla and, and pay your registration fee. He said, okay, we'll buy you tickets and we'll pay your registration fee. And I won that Tech Idol award. Yeah. <laughs> That's the most special because it's the first award I ever won. But then we built the zero liquid discharge plant for Pioneer Natural Resources in the Midland Basin. And that got nominated for Industrial Water Project of the Year. And there were some really solid nominations that year, but we somehow still won that award. Uh, that was in Paris. Uh, we won uh, Water Technology Company of the Year. I think also last year won Desalination Company. We'll come back at the end to your nomination for this year, because I guess finally you're in the main event. So <laughs> before that, I really want to understand your path. I'm coming back to, to that timeline. When you arrive in Asia, you don't go at it the traditional way, which somewhat was to be expected from Gradient. A normal company would open a sales office and start pushing what was developed from the headquarters and then build from there. You built a regional headquarter, which is almost your second headquarter in Singapore, which is also now your R&D center. So basically you said, not only do we, do we want to be there, but we also want to develop there. What was the rationale for that move? At the core of what Gradient has to offer is my innovation centers. They are more than just R&D centers. They are where I do application work, where I develop bespoke solutions for my clients. And while through the sixth year of Gradient, Anurag and I were every month traveling from Boston to China, India, and Singapore mainly, and setting up operations and winning projects, it was a huge toll on our families. So we were thinking perhaps one of us at least should relocate to Asia. And I was thinking India, to be honest. That's where I'm from. I'm from South India. For me, there's no better place than Chennai in the world for all its flaws. So I, I was thinking of moving there, but the Singapore government at the Global Water Summit, when we won the Industrial Water Project of the Year, they had a representative from their prime minister's office and they approached us and said, you guys are a very exciting company. You should come to Singapore and build an R&D center. At that time, didn't make much of it, but then later on, they followed up with us. They visited us in Boston and they made a presentation of how this might work. So they gave us an incentive grant to develop an innovation center in Singapore. So that's why I moved there because at that time uh, in Gradient's history, I was not necessarily involved with the business development side. I was focused on technology, 
and delivering solutions to my client. I would go for in every single installation and commissioning. At the time, I spent uh, six months straight at our first day of liquid discharge plant, that one that award that I mentioned, and my wife uh, was getting quite frustrated <laughs> with me at that time. But my role has since significantly evolved, evolved because when I got to Singapore, I was the only person there for Gradient. And I went out and started selling myself. And I brought a core R&D team with me from Boston, leaving some of my R&D team there to develop the center here. And we have just gone from strength to strength. Because we had that R&D center, we can do things for our clients that Violia and uh, Suez back then and others cannot because we, we can develop a bespoke solution. About 60% of Gradient's projects even today are sole sourced for that reason. 60% of Gradient's projects has no competition because we develop the solution from scratch for our client. And we are following that same model again. Uh, we received a very generous incentive grant from Abu Dhabi Investment Office. So you, I'm talking to you from Abu Dhabi now, I moved again. That's what's going to be my follow-up question. When did you move to Abu Dhabi? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Singapore uh, has grown from one person to 120 people. The Asia Pacific region, including Australia, has about 500 people at Brady. So I moved here now because I have people who are excellent at running that. And uh, I'm building an innovation center here. They already have projects with the local tannery and the TSE polishing industrial units. Uh, I have to pick on that one. You mentioned 60% of your projects don't have competition because you're developing the solution for the customer. Yes. Does that mean that purchasing departments hate you? <laughs> Not necessarily. They always want to have two offers or three offers. That parts of their job description. So you're, you're killing their job. I haven't come across purchasing people who necessarily hate us. We work with them on terms and our pricing is uh, reasonable. And for one, we take away their capital concerns in many situations. Like, you know, we do a lot of build on operate. So we bring the capital to the table. So in some ways, we are the favorite of these purchasing people because we are not taking away from their budgets. They only pay over a period of time. I've never uh, been asked that question. Very interesting. This 60 percent, is it like a picture as of now? How's the trend evolving? Because I could imagine, here's what I would figure out. I would figure out that when you start out in oil and gas, produced water coming with the BOO, which you said you stole from your customer as a concept, which is a super clever idea. I could imagine nearly 100% of those deals must have been proprietary. But then as time goes and you enter into the larger ocean, the larger markets, you start competing with the others, which means you don't only go on the projects you've cooked, but you also go to the ones which are a bit more open where you can bring your creativity, your technology and your excellence in operation. So I would imagine that those 60% number is doomed to go down with time. It will go down, but it, it's not going to get to 5%. Let me put it that way. It will go down to ideally 50%, then no more than that 40%. Maybe. I'll give you some examples to highlight why it's sole source. GlaxoSmith claimed, I have permission from them to talk about this. They came to us with a problem. Uh, they had an amoxicillin production facility. This is a 30-year-old facility in Singapore. And over time, their solvents have evolved and uh, become different from what they were using before. The salt content in their wastewater had significantly increased. So their existing plants did not work. By the time I got to Singapore, they had already done an RFP. Three companies, all of whom you will know, large companies in water, all of whom you have interviewed in this podcast forum. I've listened to their nice interviews. You can give names. I don't want to say anything <laughs> bad about anyone. If there's one thing, we like to put out good vibes only. They had given proposals for zero liquid discharge systems and minimum liquid discharge systems to eliminate this issue. But nothing fully solved their problem. Because as part of concentrating this water, some combination of solvents was precipitating out as a tar-like substance. So I got there late. I didn't participate in the RFP. I didn't know about the plastic. But Shankar Natarajan, who is our global head of sales today, who was at Siemens at the time, said that Siemens did not bid on this. I knew him, so he came to me and said, you are here, why don't you go and talk to GSK? So I talked to GSK. They were not happy with any of the bids. They said they will give me a sample. They, I said I need a tote of water. And I brought one of my CGE units from the U.S., I set it up within a month of me arriving there and I started testing myself I, uh, and, and a couple of other people had moved at that point. And then I brought them in and I showed them the results and I showed the star-like substance is precipitating out. They asked me, what are you going to do? We chemically developed a solution to 
delay the formation of the same. And uh, we built a larger scale system in the lab by that point and I tested again and I showed them. And then they said, uh, can you engineer a large scale system, a $15 million system to treat this water zero liquid discharge? And I said, I have to be paid for that. So they paid me some amount of money. I engineered the system. They allowed it. And uh, I used my US engineers at the time, but we are this funding. I started hiring in Singapore and building the team out from there. I had a full-blown set of engineers at the end of it, and they gave us the order for the $15 million system. No other company was invited at that point uh, to bid. I'll give you another example also. There is a semiconductor client we are working with in the US. We bid along with others on the effluent treatment plant for the semiconductor. But what Gradient did was we proposed uh, complete recycling, 99% recycling of the water. So to the extent that becomes feed for the ultra pure water. So because we proposed that and our life cycle cost of water was lower than others, not only did we win the wastewater, but we also won the UPW as a consequence of that because then they have one neck to squeeze as some of my American friends like to say, because we would produce the feed to the UPW, we would operate the UPW and deliver the ultra pure water. What's the barrier here for others to do the same? Is it your 250 patents or is it the people? It's the people and the solution capability. Their tents are from the people, so it's, it's just a byproduct. It's the people. I have the best solution development team in the world and nobody leaves credit. Our company culture is such that all the top people I've hired, the first six people who left MIT and started Gradient are all still at Gradient. It's one thing I'm very proud of. Gradient leaves a positive impact in the life of our employees. I have a question to which I would understand if you don't answer. So I'm just curious. Do you also give participation in the company to your employees? Yes. So a company like us in tech, for example, in the Silicon Valley, which has raised about $400 million total to date as a unicorn, has done series B level funding, normally would have one to one and a half percent owned by employees. We have 7%. And that doesn't include Anurav and me, of course. Uh, as founders, we own a huge chunk also. We believe in our people. We have been always good at giving stock options. You mentioned huge chunk. How, how huge is that chunk, which you still own with Anurag? <laughs> Well, we are fine. Let me put it that way. We don't need for anything. As we are on the money raising topic, I had a discussion on that microphone with Brian Iverson from Simra Capital, who said mm -hmm. that venture capital doesn't have a proven track record of working in water. And he challenged me to look into which VC in the world might contradict that thesis. And to give him credit, it's pretty difficult to identify one which would really foot the bill. Yet, mm. one of my hypotheses is that Keith Wilson, who's on your board from Cranberry Capital, who invested in Gradient in 2013, I'm making really wild assumptions, but I would assume that by now, and I know it's fictive because you haven't exited, so it's still valuation money, but he would be around a 20 to 25x on his initial investment. Oh, much more than that. <laughs> much more than that. Okay. Much more than that. Uh, Keith is the partner of Arunas Chesanas, the person I mentioned earlier, the MIT alumnus who started Paytech and is one of our mentors till today and who gave us the first check. He is, in my opinion, the only successful VC in the history of the water industry. You might have fun having him on the podcast, especially Arunas. I reached out. They, they haven't answered me yet, but <laughs> maybe you can help me with that. If you have the proof that one VC is the successful one, then that's the one I want on the podcast. So <laughs> on that funding path, you've raised last year your Series D for $225 million. I think it's record breaking, pretty obviously in that sector. I think your Series C was already a record breaking with the $105 million. What next? Is it a Series E, which makes you a decacorn? Is it an IPO, which might be challenging because of your initial business model, even oh. though you, you said it's not the only one, but which is pretty cash intensive? Are you still a size where a major could acquire you or are you already too big? We are unusual in the sense that Anurag and I have never dwelled upon and sat and strategized how we will exit. You might think this is not music to the ears of my investors, but it is. The investors we have brought on board without exception, each and every one of them, want us to build the most impactful water company in the world. And the exit side of it for, for them 
will naturally come. That's what they believe. That's what Gradian believes. We have done IPO readiness. That doesn't mean we are IPOing in the in the interim. See, Anurag and I are entrepreneurs, and uh, you know, SOX compliance and these things are not very attractive to us. Anurag often jokes, "I'll get fired shortly after we IPO," <laughs> <laughs> which might or may not be true. But uh, we want to be a process-driven company and have excellent internal financial controls and processes. So we brought on board Govind Aragapan, who was the CEO of Evoqua for this Asia-Pacific division. And he has built this gradient growth engine around which he is building these processes to get us super organized and not snappy in any form or shape as a company internally or externally. We have uh, invested in IPO readiness. There is tremendous interest because Every fund from BlackRock to the smallest fund in the world wants to put money in water. And the opportunity to put equity in companies is very, very less. Especially they want to invest, you know, a billion dollars. And there are not many companies that they can put that money into. Of course, there are projects they can invest in. But the economics and the upside of projects are very different. The risk profiles are very different to equity investments. So the equity-focused funds who want to put that kind of money in, Gradient, we're very fortunate in a way that we have become a natural first options for, for those people. The decision around fundraising will be purely business-based. One of the Gradient Growth Engine initiatives is to build a centralized manufacturing center of excellence, which is produce most of my water treatment systems in one place, not just systems, but also produce confidence store and also produce some components. For example, we make our own CFRO membrane. We buy RO membrane and we modify the surface to make CFRO membrane. And we are into chemicals also at this point. We want to produce that in one place, test the systems there, disassemble, send it to site and assemble at the site. So that's going to be a big initiative for us. Uh, we are picking the location. There are multiple offers on countries coming forward to offer us incentives to centralize this in their place, obviously for local employment and economic growth reasons. Would you branch out at that point into municipal or would you stay in your industrial lane? You're based in Abu Dhabi in that region and having a technology which earned you the title at some point of destination company of the year, one would think that one natural evolution would be the municipal market. We have multiple CFRO units and desalination plants in this region. We are taking seawater out of brine and we are producing fresh water until the brine reaches 120, 130,000 milligrams per liter. We are able to do that at roughly the same cost of water at seawater RO. The advantage, of course, being you don't have to build new pretreatment, you don't have to build intakes and outfalls and permitting. It's easier. We don't want to do anything undifferentiated. I don't want to come. See, Metito, for example, great company and also nominated for Water Company of the Year. Other than competing for that award, we hardly compete with Metito on nothing. Because I don't want to be another Metito. I don't want to be another Veolia even. Gradient, for the lack of a better analogy, is the Google of the water industry where we are building differentiated solutions which make an impact for our clients. Okay, you're the Google of the water industry. At some point, the founders of Google were no longer the best executives to run the company. Yeah. Do you think that might happen to Gradient at some point? Absolutely. Would you be ready for that? And what would you do at that point? Absolutely, it will happen to Gradient. But Anurag and I have core strengths which can contribute, not just from a CEO or COO perspective, but uh, you know, uh, from other perspectives. We already have handed off the PNL responsibility globally to Govinda Raghavan. We have brought on board Anand Patmanabhan, who used to be CFO of a division of G Water, and then he was CFO of a part of Siemens, Evoqua at some point also. So we have brought on board people who are day-to-day -day running the company. But at the same time, Anurag and I are not just evangelists. We have core strengths where we can. I am developing markets. So this whole region is under me. I'm developing this region, but also involved in technology and product development. The next product, EFAS. And uh, we have a pilot, which we are currently operating on that, the dialect lithium extraction systems. I have a product roadmap, which I don't want to fully reveal. But I want to discuss it because I, I, I heard you mentioning PFAS and lithium. And if you look at, I mean, still follow the money, look uh, where 
investments are going, PFAS and lithium are two verticals which right now are very hot in investments, also pretty hot in the market. I see it as a natural step for you to go into PFAS because you've been into AOPs from the early stages of the company. So that sounds like a natural field to go within. I was a bit more surprised to see you branching out and pushing into DLE. I acknowledge that there's a ZLD element inside lithium, but that would be lithium refining. You're interested in the direct lithium extraction, which is this early step. Which one do we take first? PFAS, lithium, you pick. And explain me what, <laughs> what got you attracted there and what you can reveal and what you cannot. I uh, respect that. <laughs> Very interestingly, uh, like a lot of product development at Gradient, it came via customers coming to me with problems. Slumberjay, who we have worked with extensively in the oil field when we started the company, they came to us and said they have this Slumberjay new energy division and they have bought assets in Nevada and South America for developing cellar brines, uh, lithium brines. And uh, we have an exclusive arrangement with them where we mutually exclusively deploy gradient technology for them. We're first using their own DLE vendor. There were challenges with piloting of that vendor. Gradient, uh, you know, thought why we can do better. <laughs> no, sorry. Not to be arrogant, but we have core expertise around removal mechanisms, which are similar to capturing lithium in other areas. So we got into that and we, we are currently piloting our own method for uh, direct lithium extraction. So Clayton uh, Valley in the US? Clayton Valley, yeah. I'm connecting the dots. <laughs> You're too well connected. Maybe I shouldn't say so many things to you. <laughs> PFAS, our microelectronics client, came to us. They have been under scrutiny from local municipalities. Microelectronics, by the way, is the largest vertical at Gradient this year. We have about 550 million in signed contracts at the beginning of the year, and about a third of that was microelectronics, including a very, very large project in the U.S., which I briefly described earlier. So they came to us and said, uh, you know, how come you guys are not in this PFAS thing? So we got into that. We did a thorough review of the landscape. And one of our genial R&D guys developed the method to destroy PFAS very, very efficiently. And via our acquisition of H plus E, there is the Atmoc Redox technology that Carl Michael Miller had acquired several years ago from Ireland into H plus E into Aquarian. That fell in our lap. And uh, David McGarry, who will be presenting at Tech Idol at GWI this time, is the one championing that for about a decade. And that's perfect for PFAS world also, destruction. That means that for PFAS, you're going down to Ali, the electrochemical route. And um, I don't know what's the latest with aquacritox, if it's supercritical or subcritical water oxidation. But those are the two Ali's you're going. You're not picking a champion and saying that's the one who will win. So I believe in two things when it comes to product development, minimum viable products are super important. If there is one thing Gradient has been successful in the field, it is getting technology to market fastest, faster than anybody else has in the water industry. The reason is the philosophy of minimum viable products. Even if it is not perfect, if it can sufficiently solve the problem, get it out into the field and test it. The second is, I believe in optionality. This is how I live my life. I like optionality in everything. I never begrudge Subway for asking me to select between 16 breads and 17 di different types of vegetables. That's what I like. When it comes to product development, nobody has a crystal ball. There are people who can predict better than others, but nobody has a crystal ball. And one of these technologies might not work in a pilot, so have to. Why not? I guess that exemplifies your analogy to Google, because that's exactly Google's approach, which you're, you're using here. If I continue on that analogy, Google is sometimes pushing out products which end up not meeting their market, and then they are very strict with that and they cut them. So which products did you have to kill? If there are not restraints put on me, I can go crazy. So the killing happens internally and most of the time by a Murak. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I would like to publicly say I begrudged him for this, doing this to me. Uh, but I had this excellent idea. I had a, a friend of mine who joined Gradient. She had this amazing idea to use the maple seed design to develop a hydro turbine. You know, if you talk to Tom Fankers, he's seen a, a prototype of this for tidal power applications. It is bi-directional, but it's totally business-wise, doesn't make any sense for Gradient to 
have developed it. I still developed it. I don't regret it, just to be clear. I didn't spend much money also. That friend of ours is now doing it on her own outside gradient. We wish her luck. Yeah. But we screw up. If that's what you're asking. I'm not asking if you screw up. I'm just asking if, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs stay with their ideas a bit too long. I guess it's also good business acumen to be ready to say, we've tested it. It's probably cool technology, but it doesn't meet what needs to be for the company. So we had to cut it out. So that was just the aim. I wasn't asking you to, to reveal the skeleton in your, <laughs> in your coffin. <laughs> we have a, a committee-based decision-making mechanism for product development because I fully recognize I have my blind spots. But I have these experienced people in the team and I have Anurag who is the best sounding board. Together uh, we'll decide to move forward with something. Whatever goes to market, whatever we have piloted per se is 100% so far. That's good. One important topic I'd like to cover with you is your, is your M&A. You mentioned Sinota and, and Space Age Lab. I think those weren't your first moves because your first moves are back in 2020 when you acquired CRS Water and Sigma Water Engineering. Yes. Most of your acquisitions have been in Asia, and we'll also discuss the European one later. But when did you realize you had to go that inorganic route? How do you start the process, and what do you learn on the go? We came to that realization around uh, just before the pandemic. We had worked so incredibly hard to get our India and uh, China divisions, and then Singapore up and running organically. In terms of ambition, Sky is the limit for the founders of Gradient. So we wanted to be in other applications and be in other countries. We realized it's impossible to get into everything organically. I'll give you a specific example. Right in my backyard at the time, I was living in Singapore. Right in my backyard at the time, there were some very, very good zero liquid discharge projects being paid out in Malaysia, but we couldn't uh, win the first two or three that we participated in. And the reason had nothing to do with our technology or solution capability, but rather that we were not there. And for me at the time to have started organically another division in Malaysia would have been too distracting. Even though Gradient is in 20 countries, we're still a very focused company. We're still a startup in that sense. We met this uh, genial, extremely likable gentleman, Swami Nathan. Tanjur, who had previously sold one of his companies to H2 Innovation in Canada. And he was running a very neat little operation out of uh, Kuala Lumpur, Sigma Water. We figured out a way to, and we don't acquire like others do. We don't have the arrogance to say that we know how to buy a company and take it from here to here without the help of the uh, people who build it already. So in all of our m and we find a way to keep the people who build the company and we incentivize them to make the company go from here to here. Uh, Sigma Order, again, is a great example. When we bought them, they were maybe six to seven million in sales. Average project size was somewhere 800,000 to a million dollars. And today they are 30 plus million in sales. Average, average project size is $5 million. We incentivize them. We give them, Gradient has an excellent balance sheet, as you can imagine. So we, we give them the ability to get uh, debt so that they can get bid bonds and performance guarantees, which they previously could not from their own pockets. We give them technology. So more than ever, Sigma Water is deploying zero liquid discharge technologies in, in Malaysia. And every one of our acquisitions have been super successful in that way. They have all grown tremendously. H plus E being the, the most recent and, and my favorite. How do you deal with H&E? H&E has that super long history. And as you mentioned in my own YouTube video about it, I had to underline how it's not the first time they got acquired. And uh, so far, it never succeeded. But also my conclusion was that if someone was to make it happen, that's probably you. So you see, I'm rather positive on that story. But I'd like to see what's your feedback some months down the line. So we have cleared all the debt of H plus E. We have brought in a huge project semiconductor, the largest project in their 80 year history as a company. And even though they had the technical expertise and the people, oh, the people, fantastic technical people at HPC, equal to Gradient. There is none of the other stuff we have done. The technical people have been equal to Gradient. For example, there is Michael Wunich, who if you ever wanted to talk industrial water and technology and process, 30 plus years at H plus E, fantastic. So they had that capability, but they were going to lose that project to, I think, Ovivo because the balance sheet was quite weak and they had not paid off their suppliers. So Govind Darag and the, the global PNL head of Gradient stepped in, went and met 
the project management company, went and met the end user, and he figured out a way to use the gradient balance sheet to get a surety bond, which helped his split, and we won that project. They're winning projects. They lost people in the past, very unfortunate, very good people who stayed for 10, 20 years plus to Veolia and Obivo and others. They're coming back. If any of them are hearing this uh, podcast, uh, you're all welcome to come back to H plus E. <laughs> because they loved the company, but they couldn't stay because of the financial risk in the past. There's no more financial risk. We have paid off all the suppliers. There is no debt in the company. We have a 120 million in order backlog and uh, hopefully signing more through the year. In your strategy, when you're opening a new geography, usually you also open a new center, which might be center of excellence, if you were mentioning, or innovation center. I mean, what you did in Singapore and Abu Dhabi. Now that you have H&E on board, which to me indicates that Europe is of interest. Yes. Does that mean that you plan on opening something the like in Europe? Yes, we are discussing with German and Dutch uh, government groups uh, to support. Uh, I wanted to guess Germany and Netherlands, but yeah, it's the obvious one usually. <laughs> but we also have started quite a partner with the local company who I can't name yet because the deal is not announced. Quite a wonderful, really well put together integration uh, workshop manufacturing center in Italy outside of Milan, uh, where we are going to be producing for H plus E. So that means that your m a spree is not over. You will further do inorganic growth. Yes, but uh, it'll be different than before. We no longer need to acquire to enter markets. There are other strategic angles uh, where we want to go deeper. So we are looking at some. My team is uh, flat out integration wise. Uh, we have an integration manager for each of these projects. And we also just implemented SAP across the company. I don't want to overburden them. So I'm not buying anything for a few months, but then you can never keep me down. Usually the point where you implement SAP is the point where you're no longer a startup because now you're into the, <laughs> but that's my vision, which is was... really personal because uh, to me, that that's that's the kind of software which is... It's not cheap, yeah. It's uh, it's multi-million dollar investment uh, and it requires the processes to be set in place. Not just uh, ERP, but we are also implementing HRIS. Uh, we've always had a good CRM system. So. Prakash, I enjoy a lot speaking with you. I have to manage your time though. If the people who listen to that are not yet convinced that you're the water company of the year, and I don't get why they wouldn't be convinced at that stage. But now you have to give them three super strong arguments. What would them be? We elevate the industry. That would be my uh, first and foremost argument. There is going to be more and more unicorns in water. There is going to be 40-year-old family companies uh, which are going to get to a billion dollars in valuation. Not to be arrogant, but but realistically speaking, riding the coattails of Gradient. So we are good. We are good for the industry. If you don't want to vote for Gradient, this, this is the second point, vote for our people. We have some of the nicest, friendliest uh, people who deserve this recognition, even more than Anurag and me. A good example is Hipley, the nicest guy in water, but uh, CTO of Osmo Flow previously, and, and so many others like him, loyal, hardworking, competent to the extreme. The third is, um, oh, we are nice people, work for us. <laughs> that's a good one. That, that's yeah. honestly a good one. I, by the way, take the opportunity to apologize to Hipley because he was in a webinar with me around the time when you acquired h and &E, and I really pushed him because I wanted to have some insights and of course <laughs> it was in a phase where you're not allowed to give anything so i was really the bad french guy in that so apologies to to, to you hip if you're you know, listening I, to I that i push him all the time so it's okay we are in the same same <laughs> prakash thanks a lot for the openness in your sharings in this deep dive it's difficult for me to take position and to say who should win and who should not and who am i to say something like that but is there another unicorn in the water space? Today, no. When did you become a unicorn in 2023? So if the aim is to crown the company of the year in 2023, without giving names, I don't see 
who else would qualify. So that's just my two cents. If that's fine with you, <laughs> to round up that interview, I have a set of rapid fire questions. Absolutely. Before we go into rapid fire, I want to say I really enjoy your podcast. I don't do many of these. I've only done one of these before with uh, my climate journey because uh, I, I found their podcast to be really good. Uh, you have interviewed pretty much everyone else except <laughs> Gradient before. And the reason is we are quite shy about this, but you do a really good job. I really enjoy listening to you on Spotify and stuff. So uh, Re really appreciate it. I, I will link to the podcast you did with Mike Limit Journey in the, in the show notes because I listened to it. It's a really great one in preparation for our conversation today. And they raised question which I didn't, as so on purpose. It's a really cool episode. I recommend it. It's in the show notes. I propose you the, the, the rapid fire questions, which are a new set, which you haven't heard yet. So you can't be prepared to, to those. It's time for the rapid fire questions. What is the toughest challenge in your opinion for a water tech startup? Commercial traction. What would be your best single piece of advice for the founders and managers of the about 1000 early stage water startups? Focus. What's the drop of knowledge you wish more investors knew about the water sector? It is extremely important. Don't they know that already? That it's important? Knowing it and knowing it, you know. That's a very good one. What was your most unexpected partnership and what did it bring you? Slumberjay, uh, Lithium. It got us into the Lithium market. We are now one of the market leaders. We have to, to, to follow up with that at some point. I took some notes, but you can't share everything about it. I understand that yet. Super short, profitability or growth? Uh, growth. I'm American, sorry. What's the next profile you'll hire? A global head of manufacturing. When you hire, are you looking for sector experience or startup experience? More than those two, attitude. Which makes fully sense with what you said about what's the special source of gradient, the people. I guess now you have to find the people who fit with the people. If not, <laughs> you're destroying your special source. Opening new markets or doubling down on the current ones? Doubling down on the current. What's that tool nobody speaks about, but you couldn't live without. Artificial intelligence. And to be more specific? The three tenants to gradient, sorry to take a longer answer. Solution-oriented listening, listening to the customer and solving their problem, not throwing stuff that we have at them. System-wide expertise, which others have, but gradient has specialized system-wide expertise. And artificial intelligence, this is the third tenant of what makes gradient gradient. What's the single piece of insight your ideal customer profile needs to hear right now? We will take away a water headache. What are you desperately needing and want to raise an open call for right now? PFAS piloting opportunities. You, Gradient? You, you I don't need... desperately need it, but I can't think of anything else. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and what can and should I do for you? Come back and talk to me in a year. I enjoyed the chat. That's a good one. My calendar is open in one year, so I'll send you an invite. <laughs> Prakash, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot for the openness and for everything you shared today. If people want to follow up with you, what's the best place to redirect them? Uh, www.gradientgradient.com So as always, the links to the website are in the show notes together with your other appearances. I just noticed that you're usually the, the media spoke person. And if I get it right from your interview with my climate journey, Anurag is more the, the guy who speaks with investors. Is it true or how the, did that come come up? It, it is. My wife finds it extremely weird that I am the media spokesperson because I am <laughs> I am not articulate or any of the things you want. Uh, I am the anti-Steve Jobs. And Anurag is way more articulate, but he's more shy. Investors are his thing. Customers are also. It just happened. No particular <laughs> Well, I look forward to, to see you probably in the flesh at the Global Water Summit and to have the sequel interview to this one in one year to, at that time, check how you're a decacorn by now. Looking forward. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Ep, ep, ep. Before you go, and in case you haven't listened to Prakash with a paper and a pen, here's some wisdom I took down that you may want to take home and apply in your water company from today on. I have seven insights for you, starting with number one, innovative business model and focus on proprietary solutions. A significant portion of Gradient's projects, 60%, are sole sourced, meaning they face no competition for these projects because they develop the solution from scratch for their clients. This approach underscores the importance of offering bespoke, innovative solutions to clients' unique problems, a strategy that can be crucial for startups, sure, but also for anyone aiming to differentiate themselves in the competitive and sometimes commoditized water market. Number two, and phases rapid technology development. Gradient 
Canadians' success is partly attributed to their philosophy of pushing technology to market quickly, embracing the concept of minimum viable product or MVP. They focus on developing technologies that are good enough to solve the problem at hand and getting them into the field for testing, rather than waiting for a perfect solution. This approach accelerates adoption and allows for real-world feedback to refine that said technology. Number three, attracting and retaining talents through generous incentives. If Prakash is so certain that Gradient Special Sauce lies in its people, it's no wonder that Gradient has set a high industry standard by allocating 7% of the company for employee participation, excluding the founders. This generous approach to employee equity is indicative of the value they place on their team's contribution to the company's success and can serve as a model for how startups might consider structuring their own incentive programs. Number four, building a strong company culture and team. I just touched on how Gradient attributes a large part of their success to the quality of their team and the company culture they have cultivated. Well, this emphasis on assembling a talented and culturally cohesive team highlights the importance of not just technical skills, but also the alignment of values and vision within the company. 5. Leveraging acquisitions for strategic growth Gradient strategic acquisitions, particularly in markets where organic growth would be too slow or challenging, demonstrate the value of targeted M&A activities to rapidly expand capabilities and market presence. There is again a talent aspect to this, as their approach to keeping and incentivizing the talent within acquired companies further underlines the importance of people in Gradient's growth strategy. Usually, mergers are all about synergies, which is a clever way to say cut redundant positions. Gradient is somewhat on the other side of that coin by saying that they can create value by merging their perks with the company's historical assets. Number six, adapting business models to market needs. Gradient's ability to adapt their business models, such as the build own operate or BOO approach that got them started in oil and gas and still gets applied today on certain projects, showcases their flexibility in meeting client needs and market demands. This adaptability is a critical strategy for navigating the complex and varied global water market. Note as well that they don't claim they've been super clever in using this approach. They actually stole it from their customers. Listen and adapt, there's win-win potential in that. Number seven, and phases on R&D and innovation centers. The establishment of innovation centers in strategic locations underscores Gradient's commitment to continuous innovation and development of bespoke solutions. This approach not only fuels their pipeline of proprietary technologies, but also positions them as a globally local leader in water tech and in the water industry. I could have taken more, but I think seven is a good chunk to go out and apply, so here you have it. If you think I've missed one that's even more important than those seven, come tell me on LinkedIn or by mail. My mail is in the description. And remember, that episode came to you free of charge, but I would believe not free of value. It takes me quite some time to put all of those together every week, so all I'm asking is for you to help me distribute them. So take this episode and share it with a colleague, a friend, your boss, or your team, and I'll be back with another one next week. Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time.